My name is Liz Jewell and I work as the Family Support Counsellor with Fragile X Association Australia. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and all the lands on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. It's with great pleasure I open this webinar and welcome our presenter, Bev Sher. Thank you, Liz, and thank you all for attending this evening. Um, I have a few partners in crime here this evening. Um, the first is Bev Kadish, who is an occupational therapist, and Bev and I both work as part of Dr. Jonathan Cohen's Fragile X Alliance Clinic and have been together seeing very many Fragile X families over the years. And I'm hoping in the question time, I'm really happy Bev's here because I'll be overlapping quite a few areas, overlapping with OT based areas. So Bev will be able to answer some questions as well. Um, another one of my partners is Sarah Velenich, who is uh, a speech pathologist who I've recently had the pleasure of, I'm almost going to go as far as to say befriending, and we're looking forward to doing some interesting speech and language related things in the Fragile X arena together in the near future. And finally, quite a few members of my team are here from my private practice with my other partner, Liz Janitsky. So thank you to those as well who came along tonight. And again, I may open the floor to some of them and ask for their opinions or perhaps some questions at the end. That would be really, really fantastic. So first and foremost, what I'm going to say before I even start my first slide is that although I have been involved in the area of Fragile X Syndrome for 24 years now and have been honoured and privileged to have worked with so many of the families, I will just give a little disclaimer. And that disclaimer is that I am no specialist when it comes to very, very young kids, so very early interventions of very little ones and or nonverbal individuals. So there certainly are therapists who are very well versed in these areas. I do not profess to be one of them. However, tonight is a general overview of all things speech and language related. And it is a follow on presentation from my last one that I did on the more verbal or the more uh, possibly higher functioning individuals. But even that can, you know, depends on how you define high functioning. So we've divided the workshops into lower language levels and higher language one and tonight's one's dealing with those who are either just developing language and that doesn't mean that these individuals are all necessarily young children because as you'll see on one of my slides what you'll see is and I will come back to the overview we're going to be talking about a chronological age versus a developmental age so it doesn't matter if we're talking about the gentleman on the left or the young boy on the right, they may actually have the same developmental age or the boy on the right may have a higher developmental age than the gentleman on the left. Okay, so we didn't want to divide this into children versus adults. But what we did want to say is we tend to work with two main groups, those that are verbal or highly verbal, able to speak in sentences and have conversations, and they have their own set of difficulties and challenges, two of which we spoke about the other night were perseverative speech, so lots of repetitive of the same sentence or the same phrase, often due to anxiety, and things like extreme social anxiety, that was that presentation, whereas tonight we're going to see all the other areas that affect those of a lower developmental age and the language age of an individual usually correlates closely to their cognitive score or their IQ potential. Okay, so I wanted to clear that one up straight away, but let's have a quick overview. We're going to see what is actually the difference between speech and language in general, especially in Fragile X, how do they differ? Next, phenotypic behavior. So a phenotype is a common set of patterns that we see or representation. So the phenotype of this particular condition brings with it typical traits that we often see. For example, things like anxiety and hyperarousal, and we're gonna discuss how those interfere with things like speech and language. 
We'll touch on some of the motor speech difficulties that are very, very apparent, such as dyspraxia, especially in the lower verbal individuals. We'll have a talk about some oral motor activities, and that's quite a controversial area. So I can imagine the speeches in the audience all going, hmm, where's the evidence basis behind doing oral motor work? I'm going to touch on that. Next one, parent responsiveness or parents as partners in communication and how interactive is a parent because interaction comes before communication or before speech. Some strategies such as sharing books or language stimulation strategies from some of the programs that you may have heard of. And finally, how visuals and AAC can actually aid comprehension and expression and not stagnate it um, in any way. So I'm going to touch on that as well. Okay. So first of all, what is the difference between speech and language? Your well, speech refers to things like clarity, the actual movement to create the speech sounds, the smoothness of the talking, that's fluency, and voice, things like how high pitch or low pitch, or is it very sing-song, the type of voice that the child or the adult may be using. Those things are all called speech. But communication involves so much more than just speech. Communication involves language too. And language is not reliant on speech. So you can actually be a wonderful communicator without having any speech whatsoever. So if we have a look at language, we can look at the main areas of language, the content, the meaning of language, the form, things like sentence structures and the rules of how words are made up. And finally, the use, which is the social usage of language. And next. So here's a nice visual that shows that the actual speech sounds are what we call phonemes. And that's our green circle. But sorry, the phonemes are the most meaningful units of speech. But if we start with just speech sounds, so even you know, an individual who just babbles or makes some high-pitched squeals, those could be regarded as speech sounds. We then move on to things like words and the building blocks of language, putting those words together, which is phrases and sentences, the meanings behind those. And then when it's in a bigger context, it's the social communication, the social usage of language. But somebody could be very social with you and still not have any oral language or speech. So it's very multidimensional. So if we're looking at fragile X, what are some of these phenotypical behaviors that may interfere in fragile X? So motor delays, and that's where we know most of the individuals work with occupational therapists. So that may delay their ability to actually use the muscles to express themselves and their clarity, their articulation. I've mentioned before, cognitive delay results in language delay and is often very closely correlated. Sensory motor integration. So using the various senses and using the muscles and combining those two to work well together. Social anxiety. So if the child feels they're on the spot and are having direct questions, you know, shot at them and are nervous, become highly anxious, hyperarousal, that ability to either get highly excitable or highly anxious, and I like to call it their engine speed. So how fast the child's internal engine speed is running is their level of hyperarousal. And if it's not at the just right engine speed, it affects their learning and their language ability. And finally, the motor planning difficulty, where, for example, to create a word involves the most incredible and intricate series of movements that it's actually a real wonder that any of us get to speak at all or that we actually learn to speak without explicit direct instruction. Next one. So to understand fragile X, you need to understand the three legs that a stool stands on, that our fragile X stool stands on, and they are, and nobody can have a thorough understanding of fragile X without really appreciating these three. The first one is anxiety, and how prevalent and prominent anxiety is in this population. 
The next is the hyperarousal, the excitedness, the engine speed, the running, my, my engine speed is just running faster than what is necessary for this particular context or situation. And finally, the counterintuitive learning style. So most individuals learn sequentially. You learn one thing, you add on the next, you add on the next until you get to the end. Our fragile X people learn their learning style is a gestalt learning style. They do better by seeing the whole rather than the parts and putting the parts together. When they can see the whole, it helps them learn better, remember it better, and understand the parts rather than giving them a sequential set of parts, which won't make much sense to them. I love this pyramid because it explains why language is often difficult for people to develop. If we have a look at our central nervous system, the base of the pyramid here are our sensory systems, all our various sensory systems that are so important. It's how we take information in about the world around us, whether it's from our eyes, whether it's from our ears, whether it's our sense of touch or our internal sensations, you know, things like for, for toilet training, all of that forms the basis of our pyramid. The next level up would be the sensory motor development. So OTs would deal so much with the, well, we'd like to hope many OTs and certainly many more being trained now that they would have um, a thorough background of sensory integration and sensory processing like somebody like Bev Kadish does. The next level up is also an area that the occupational therapists deal with. Things like, you know, can the child hold their body upright? Or are they aware that this side of my body can actually cross the midline to cross over and that I can do something separate with that part of my body or reach over to get something? Moving up is where we get some of those fine motor skills, so sort of those eye-hand coordination skills. But only above those do we actually get the auditory language skills. Okay, so there are so many necessary skills that need to be intact below the auditory and the language skills in order for those to function well. And that's why we know all of these foundation areas are quite fragile, quite unstable in our individuals we're talking about tonight. And that's why it's a big ask to expect the language skills to be right up there with other children their age. And finally, the academic learning, behavior, and the daily living activities are really just the apex of our pyramid, relying on all these underlying skills. So a few general guidelines that I'd like to give you with regards to all things speech and language relating to fragile X. First of all is the importance of having a multidisciplinary team. I've mentioned occupational therapists already. OT and speech, for them to work together is the absolute gold standard in fragile X. And not often just as say, Bev Kadish and I would work, we do an initial consult together sometimes, or we'll have a chat about an individual client. But in countries where uh, your therapies are paid for, for example, like Sarah's, you know, her background is she's from Italy and she indicated she always ran her sessions with an OT next to her because no individuals had to pay for therapy. So it wasn't like, you know, doubling up on the therapy rate that way. So multidisciplinary intervention is amazing. Early intervention, the earlier we get in, the more we can maximize the individual's potential. However, it is never too late. So if you have an adult living in your home with you and you think, ah, oh, we missed out on, you know, that, that, that early speech therapy. It's never, ever too late. I've started seeing an adult who is 19 and he never had much early intervention and his language and communication growth in the last year has been quite staggering. Another adult I work with who was completely nonverbal and Bev works with him as well due to his social anxiety in less than a year that we've been working with him. Again, it's the comment that we often get, you know, how do we actually shut these individuals up now? Once we were worried they'd never talk and now it's, 
they just talk all the time, which is music to everybody's ears. Another guideline is fragile X individuals have a real strength and that is their ability to imitate. So when placing them with others, for example, in a classroom, we really do want wherever possible mainstream peers as models for these individuals. And even if they go to perhaps a specialist school setting for part of the time, as long as there's still that access to mainstream peers, that is absolutely ideal because of their ability to imitate. And presenting the ideas in a gestalt way, so showing the whole rather than just the individual bits and drip feeding or spoon feeding, first get the overall and then we can deal with the individual skills. Their intervention needs to be applicable to real life activities. So it's got to be meaningful. The more relevant the therapy is to the child. So I want you to think about sort of naturalistic relationship-based therapies using their really high interest areas. So the more relevant the therapy is to the child, the more likely they are to develop some stronger language skills. High interest areas, are a real carrot, and I call it a carrot, you know, because not only is it a reward that can be used really successfully, but you will have that child's interest so much quicker if you are teaching from their high interest areas versus from your own high interest areas. So we really do need to follow their agenda rather than our own. A little man I work with who's starting preschool, he has a real love for all things Mickey Mouse, and what we have guided the educators to do is to ensure that Mickey Mouse does a new skill before the child's expected to do it, okay? Not only does it calm the anxiety, but it will grab his attention straight away. And if he's engaged, he's learning. And if he's having fun, he's learning even more. So wherever we can use high interest areas, the better. Some more guidelines to general intervention. We need to plan for their motivation and attention. I've just spoken about that. What's going to push their buttons? What's going to do it for them? We need to use a multi-sensory approach, not just what can they see, but also what can they hear? So music and rhythm are both wonderful guidelines for working with fragile X individuals. You know, the sense of touch, things like deep pressure, which is incredibly calming. How else could we use you know, one of the pacing ways that we get individuals to slow down when they do start speaking is to use tapping, a tapping method or a pacing method on their leg, that sense of touch, but be aware that they may be very hypersensitive to touch. So we need to keep that in mind as well. Routines. If we know what's coming next, we feel more calm. If they have a set routine and we can teach through those routines, the more their learning is going to improve. Adapting for their learning style, like we said, the gestalt learning, planning for hyperarousal, knowing that if we do start playing a silly game, they probably will become very quickly and very easily hyperaroused. But then knowing that we've got some calming suggestions from the occupational therapist, for example, or providing them with frequent breaks, or helping them to calm through the jaw by giving them something to bite on, for example. The more general guidelines. Encourage imitation wherever you can, because that's working from their strengths. Oral exploratory play. So getting them to really explore things by using their mouth. You know, often we say, oh, your mouth is everything. That's great. That's how he's learning. Okay. But exploring the mouth and exploring what can I do with my mouth, things like blowing, things like puffing up cheeks, because that actually helps to aid in sound production. If the individual is more aware of what their mouth can do and the fact that we can move our tongue from side to side or practice licking some very salty or um, sour lolly type sprinkles off a mirror, all of these things do actually aid them to be able to then use their tongue for speech as well, because our speech mechanism is the same as our eating mechanism, okay? Um, using a total communication approach. So what that means is not just relying on speech as our means of communication, but using a total communication approach. So it may be a combination of some sign language, or just some keyword signs, the most important signs. 
It may be the one I tend to use the most, which is gesture. So things like showing them under and on, just natural gestures that aren't necessarily a set um, language in and of itself, like sign languages, using pictures, um, using things like visuals. All of these come under total communication, and that also includes alternative and augmentative communication, AAC, whether that be high-tech devices like specialized um, machinery, machines, or iPads with software on them that actually are an alternative communication system, or low-tech devices such as exchanging pictures to get their message across as to what it is that they're requesting. So a total communication approach um, and I want you just to remember this because we'll come to it a bit later again. By using these augmentative methods or these alternative methods, it is not going to stop your individual from communicating verbally. It's only going to enhance them to use speech. They will ultimately use whatever means of communication is easiest for them. Okay, let's really use this total communication approach and not fear it because it's what's going to support the individual to ultimately use speech. It's not going to replace their ability or their want to use speech, okay? Some things to take advantage of, the strong imitation skills, I've said that several times already. The love for all things dramatic. So without being too loud or too shrill the pitch, but using a very dramatic expression when trying to teach a new concept, for example. Using rhythmic input, I've already referred to the idea of tapping and a whole range of language stimulation techniques. Okay, so those are just some of our more general guidelines. And this is a great slide that uh, summarizes some of the things I've been speaking about. We look at the strengths in Fragile X, we know they learn simultaneously with the whole. They're primarily visual learners. So we use visuals with them because a picture is worth a thousand words. We use their strong imitation skills. I've just said it for the fourth time. And that's why we pair them with other children who function at possibly even a higher level than them. Take advantage of concepts by using perhaps a peer next to them uh, a triangulated teaching approach. So it's not just one, me and them, but using others around us, using that real naturalistic type of context-based learning and relationship-based learning. They're highly emotional. So we use our exaggerated expressions, but not being too overwhelming. They have a strong memory for routines. So we use routines because they're predictable and they're calming. Use their interest areas. Great sense of humor individuals with fragile X have, and that's why all of those who work with them do consider ourselves very, very privileged. They have a real social drive, which, in my opinion, differentiates them the most from individuals with autism who often lack that social drive. However, even individuals with autism, just because they may be on their own, doesn't mean that they don't have that longing or that want to be with others. It's just often too difficult. And also remember that we have what's called a comorbidity when many individuals have more than one condition. We do see individuals with both fragile X as well as autism, okay? And their language is often expected to be further delayed or further disordered than those who don't have the diagnosis of autism. We do know though that hyperarousal and anxiety negatively affect learning to two legs off the stool and finally their poor executive functioning skills so whether it be the ability to hold on you know their working memory skills are often weak or their organizational skills remember we said sequence sequential learning is really hard for them but seeing the whole is so much easier so let's go on to speech now what are some of the characteristics of speech in individuals with fragile x well a fast speech rate, okay? Often so fast that it's tricky to actually understand what they're saying. A disordered rhythm, so it might be someone's put together and then a single word on its own. There isn't just that smooth flow to the speech. Articulation errors, so similar to typically developing individuals where speech develops in, we go from our earliest to produce sounds and gradually we learn the more difficult to produce sounds. 
they may have ongoing developmental errors in their speech, as well as something called dyspraxia. And all of these things together result in speech sounding very cluttered. And the best analogy I can give for cluttered speech is making mincemeat out of their speech. So everything's just mushed together like mincemeat versus beautiful individual sausages or beautiful individual pieces of eye fillet. Okay, so a strategy such as using a pacing board like this, separating out each word. Um, there's a wonderful piece of software that one of my staff shared with me called Widget, which actually puts a symbol, a picture for each word. And when I'm working with many of my young adults now who can focus better, we look at saying each word and pointing to each picture as a form of a pacing board as well. So how can we help this rate and rhythm that seems so fast and so disordered? We need to calm that individual down because their hyperarousal level, their anxiety or their excitement is what is causing their speech to be so fast. We can use whole body movements and all things dramatic, whether it be animal movements or water flowing and getting them to use their whole body because movement comes before speech. And often when we pair movement, we get more speech output. So using whole body movements to give them those concepts of slow and smooth and all things rhythmic. So I've mentioned dyspraxia. What is it? It's a motor, a muscle speech difficulty due to problems with sequencing. Ha! Ah, there we go. Sequencing. They struggle with sequential learning. They learn better as a whole. And the idea of those coordination, of you know, coordinating the movements, we know all things coordination related are difficult for them. And you can have a whole body dyspraxia, meaning all muscles are difficult for them to coordinate and to do smoothly in sequence. Or it could just be a verbal dyspraxia, which means it's when it's linked to speech that they struggle with that. And there's also something called an oral dyspraxia, which is even when there's no speech sounds paired with it, they can't, on a voluntary base, tell the tongue what to do. So, for example, you may say stick a tongue out, and there's these groping, struggling movements. But if you give them an icy pole, they straight away can lick that icy pole because it's not a voluntary movement that the brain is telling the tongue to do. It's quite, it's done quite subconsciously. So oral motor skills, oh no, I might talk a little bit more about dyspraxia. I had some other notes here. If an individual has severe dyspraxia, they may need to rely on one of those AAC devices as their primary means of communication. A good intervention strategy is to work from the sounds that are easy for them to produce and do combinations of vowels and consonants, so syllables they can produce, in order to build their confidence to approach the ones that are harder for them to produce. So we really want to work from a positive and um, motivating um, situation rather than setting them up for failure. Oral exploratory play, so exploring things with the mouth, blowing, can actually help them produce speech sounds. So for example, when I blow a cotton ball to play soccer and get it into the goals, that's my mouth posture, my mouth position, and that's the exact same mouth position that I need when making a woo sound. Okay, so things like that. Mirror work is fantastic because of their strong imitative skills. If they can see somebody else in a mirror, see what they're doing, see how we can change it. Video modeling, getting them to watch others and a close up of the face, really good. Do beware of programs that require lots of touch. Now, this isn't for every individual because some of them really tolerate touch well, especially you know, in this oral area perhaps, but there are some programs such as Prompt where the individual's jaw and mouth and tongue and lips are needed to be manipulated by the speech therapist. And if they are very hypersensitive to touch, chances are you're going to get bitten very, very quickly. Okay, so you may have to desensitize that oral area before the speech pathologist works in that area. And what we do is we work on desensitizing the rest of the body and working inwards until we get to the mouth. So we work from the outside in. But generally there's a wide range of different programs for dyspraxia. 
many of which rely on high rep repetition rates and draw rates, so a hundred productions of you know a particular word, and in a short space of time, and it's very often a matter of trial and error and a combination of some of these approaches to actually do what works best. Okay, let's move on to oral motor. So oral motor skills. Often the child's behavior, you know, we say behavior is communication. They're communicating something through their behavior. So behavior will tell you what the individual needs. So if their arousal state is really high, you may see them hand biting or chewing their clothes like that. And that's usually a message of, I, I'm spinning out here or I'm freaking out here. This is all just too much for me. It might be too loud, too bright, too much movement around them. And that is their way of telling you that through their behavior. So what we need to do is we need to try and replace some of these inappropriate biting type skills with more appropriate skills whilst still feeding the need. So feed the need. If there's a sensory need, it needs to be filled. So if the biting is what's calming them, let's give them some biting alternatives. So here's a little Tupperware box. And at the Fragile X Conference in America, they refer to this as a bob box, a biting options box. So there was some licorice to bite on. There was some gum. There was some fruit straps, which are very chewy. Something that is going to give the child that same deep pressure, that same input that is going to help calm them. And that will then enable them to not only concentrate, but will reduce their inappropriate behaviors and also give them that ability to hopefully use their language more and to learn more when they are feeling calm. So a bob box, a biting options box is a great idea. The bottom image is of some of those chewy toys that some of you may have seen. There's great jewelry. So, you know, really fashionable bracelets or pendants that can be worn on a necklace that can just be there as a biting option, which is a far more appropriate reaction to going and biting the child or the adult next to them. Sucking a range of straws, sucking liquids of different thicknesses through the straws gives us that deep pressure through the jaw and any deep work through the mouth is incredibly calming. And similarly, the idea of blowing and blowing bubbles. Many of these individuals have low oral tone. So that kind of a look with the tongue sitting at the bottom of the mouth, often drooling as a result of this low tone. Other things in the motor, oral motor area may be the sensitivity to touch, which we've spoken about already. And again, just use the sucking, the blowing and biting activities because neurologically they work to calm and focus the child. Okay, moving on. Let's go on to some of the more language-based skills now. So I spoke earlier the idea of, um, you know, language in itself has got three components, the meaning, the form, and the usage. Social language refers to the usage, and I'll touch on that. But before I do, also, you may hear terms like receptive language, which is the comprehension or the understanding as well as expressive language, which is the actual output, the whether it be speech or whether it be a sign or whether it be a picture, the message the child's actually giving, not receiving. So in Fragile X, the receptive skills, they have relatively strong receptive single word vocabulary, and so many studies have shown this. They have reduced attention and auditory memory and sequential processing, which makes comprehension very difficult because those are all important building blocks in order to understand what someone may be saying to you and poor working memory. Working memory is that ability to hold information in your head and manipulate it in some way to do something with it. So for example, um, if an instruction is given, that involves working memory because while you've done the first thing, you have to still hold those other components in your head and visualize what is it I need to do next Ah, oh, yeah, and then go and do it, okay? On the expressive side, a great sense of humor. So anything humor-based um, is a strength. Strong verbal imitation skills. So if you've, you know, heard um, these individuals mimic 
actors and actresses so well, so, so well, but they may not have something meaningful to share in their communication. It may just be lines or phrases from movies that they've seen. Uh, speech is late in developing, and often the speech and language characteristics are often the first indicator to parents that something is not quite right with their child. The perseverative or the repetitive language is the most unique and defining characteristic of fragile X syndrome. So for all the therapists in the audience, if you're hearing a child using these highly repetitive phrases or, you know, there's a fire drill today, or there's a fire drill, I'm, you know, I'm not worried there's going to be a fire drill, and then you try and redirect them, and 30 seconds later, oh, there's a fire drill, fire drill, yeah, fire drill, fire drill, that often is an indication that there could be an element of, um, or that certainly that Fragile X testing is indicated. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Fragile X, the best part about Fragile X is that it can be diagnosed with a blood test. So it's not subjective. It's you either do or you don't have the Fragile X gene. Okay, so that's receptive language we've spoken about, expressive language, but that's social usage of language. Direct questions are really difficult for these individuals. Again, the anxiety shoots up. So a far better strategy to use is to make a comment and wait and see if they can then communicate in some way, either through a sound or babble or a squeal or a picture or a sign. It doesn't matter how they communicate, but rather than asking a direct question, make a comment and wait for them to then link on. Phrase and topic perseveration, so again, relates to the anxiety, but in the lower verbal individuals, we may not see that as much. And then the poor eye contact, which is nonverbal you know, social language. However, there is a golden rule in Fragile X, and that is never, ever, 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 ever demand eye contact. Because chances are, by even looking directly at an individual, their anxiety levels shoot up. You're far better off if you stand next to them or even turn your back away from them if they're highly anxious. That will decrease their anxiety level. And with time, and as soon as they're more comfortable, their eye contact will improve with you. But we never demand eye contact. So how do we support their poor comprehension? We do it through pictures. We do it with all things visual. And I've got lots and lots of examples now. I'm just making sure I'm leaving time for some questions of how we can support comprehension. So I've said it before, a picture is worth a thousand words. If they can see it, they don't have to hold it in their working memory. If they can see the whole of how their whole day looks, they don't have to worry about what's coming next, which is gonna make them more anxious, which will stop them from learning and stop them from communicating. So can you see how this bigger picture starts working with when we've got a better understanding of fragile X, we understand their learning style and we can adapt accordingly. Um, another way to aid um, their comprehension is something we call social stories. And just the other day, I worked with a mom of a very little one who said to me, yeah, I've used social stories for my older son, but, you know, my three-year-old, he, he, he's just not at that level where he could relate to social stories. And I disagree because they can really, really, really be simplified. They can be simplified down to just a picture with even a single word, okay? They do not need to be the more complex social stories which deal with all the emotional responses and people's thoughts and people's feelings in a particular situation. You know, these could be something like, time to go back to school, I'll meet my new teacher. And it might be just two or three short ideas in a social story that creates wonderful predictability for the child as to what's expected of them and what they can best expect to be more prepared. There's amazing apps that can be used. So here's an example of a, an app called Book Creator, where you can actually use the child's illustrations, photos of the child, and you put it all into a book, some sort of a story book. And I will touch on the importance of book sharing a little bit later on. It's not about the child sitting quietly and listening to a book being read to them, because anybody with a young child or an adult with a moderate intellectual disability will know that um, it's very difficult to get them to sit and you know, do the expected, which is to sit and listen when a book's read to them. It's not about the book being read to them. It's about the book being shared 
with them, about them initiating, pointing to what they want, to them turning to whichever page it is that interests them, we need to follow their lead, okay? And it's not about the necessarily the words written there, but making up your own words, watching them carefully and seeing their responses as well. So that leads on nicely to some of the language stimulation strategies that we use. There's a whole range of language programs that are currently used to build language, especially in young kids, as well as in the autistic population. Some of the names you may have heard of are things like DIR floor time, which is very play-based and very interactive. Others are the early start Denver model, which has got a very good evidence basis behind it. Yet the study in which ESDM was used with Fragile X, the outcome was that although parents did very well with learning the strategies, et cetera, the actual outcomes in the individuals with, with Fragile X themselves were variable and more work is still needed in that area. The Hannon program is recommended and because it, it touches on all those skills and all those features that I said before, naturalistic, joint attention, interactive, enjoyable, play-based, things like that. There's another one that I learned of, thanks to Sarah, and that is Jasper, okay, the Jasper program. And I did have it written down, Jasper stands for Joint Attention, Symbolic Play, Engagement and Regulation. And that's another program used often for autism. So other things used are things like ABA therapy, which is less sort of interactive and less driven by the individual themselves where we follow their lead. So there's almost a continuum of different approaches. Um, like I said, the Hannon program was mentioned at the last Fragile X conference that I went to, but that doesn't mean that all the other ones can't be helpful too. So some of the ideas from the Hannon program, follow the child's lead, imitate them, interpret in your own words what it is you think they're trying to say, comment, don't use those direct questions, it increases the anxiety, and joining in and playing with the child or the adult. Being an owl, I love this one, stands for the O is observe. What are they interested in? Follow their lead. We know in Fragile X, use their harm motivation interests. Wait, stop talking, lean forward, look at the child expectantly, and just wait, say less to get the child to say more. And finally, listen, place close attention to their sounds and their words. So remind yourself to be an owl, expanding on the utterances. So if they say doggy, that could be the single block, then you could go, yeah, big doggy. And then once they're able to use two words and say things like big doggy, you could go up to the three block stage and go, yeah, big doggy's barking. Okay, and then when they're using three word utterances, you could add on later and go, ah, oh, if they say big dog is barking, you can say, mm hmm, big dog is barking loudly. Okay, that type of idea. But I also like this visual because the more we can use concrete materials such as links or blocks to actually show the child we're expanding on what they say or the adult. We are running a bit out of time so I might just say the four S's I like these as the partner interacting say less stress the most important words slow down and show don't tell use visuals use gestures point to things and talk about the here and now because abstract reasoning in fragile X is a real deficit area it's very hard to think of things in the future or things in the past so use the here and now here are just, you know, some of the instead of. So instead of just watching your child, join in with them. Instead of insisting they play with the toy that you want, see what they find interesting. Instead of asking questions, make your comments and wait. And instead of feeling reserved or self-conscious, remember you are the best toy in the house. I love that. So we've mentioned AAC. What is it? I told you it's a total communication approach, whether it be sign language, an actual device, it could even be your own facial expressions, some natural gestures, things like emojis, or even texting. All of these would be regarded as augmentative or alternative communication. And the golden rule was that all of these things 
will only help to produce language, verbal language, not stunted in any way. And there was something else I wanted to read that the majority of individuals with fragile X do in fact develop a level of speech and language, okay? Uh, in fact, I, in all my years, and yet to meet an adult, I think I've met one who was completely nonverbal, as we say. So some examples. There is an AAC program called Proloquo to Go. And another one that's sometimes recommended is called LAMP, Words for Life. I know Sarah's preference is for Proloquo to Go because she feels these individuals, uh, because of their strong vocabulary skills, are a, often able to work within categories, whereas LAMP relies more on motor planning, which we know is an area of difficulty. But the, you know, it, these things involve trials so that you can work out which system may work best for the particular individual. And what you'll see here is that the, you know, the words actually have different colored borders around them. Some of them are what we call the core words and core words make up 70 to 90% of the words that we use every day in our communication. Whereas the others, the ones used less frequently are called fringe words. And at the bottom, the ones with the black borders are actual categories. So I want, and you know, if it's a specific vegetable, for example, you could go to the category of vegetables and then select the word you want. And it's got the voice output whereby once you've made your sentence, I go to school, you tap at the end of the sentence and a voice says the sentence for them. Here's another visual communication system called PICS, which stands for Picture Exchange Communication System. It's the idea of using a sentence strip like I want, and the child goes and chooses the, the item that they want, puts it on their sentence strip, and the parent goes, ah, I want trampoline. And off you go, and you validating that the child has communicated their message to you. Uh, I did touch on core vocabulary versus fringe. So there's an example of the more commonly used words like finished, want, I, look, like, don't like, no, versus the fringe, which is a particular board game or your turn, um, or Simon says, you know, the name of the individual repertoire of things that they enjoy communicating about. We also have other low tech options, which is pages and pages that are perhaps bound together. This is a system called POD, P-O-D-D. Some individuals may feel that by working on an iPad, for example, the individual's just too fixated on wanting to get onto YouTube because of their high interest area. And that's why having a separate device specifically for communication is a good way to go. And they're very durable cases that can be dropped and smashed and stamped on and all things like that. But for others, a low tech, a paper based communication system is a better way to go. I did mention Widget, which is a website with a very reasonable subscription. And all you do is type in a sentence and it puts the picture symbols up there in a few seconds for you and lovely for social stories and as a pacing board as well. Some other examples, here's a visual we use all the time, a first then board. Usually the less preferred activity goes first with the then being the more preferred activity, okay? But it comes down to that basic idea, when I know what's coming next, I can feel calm. This is a task visual schedule, so actually completing a task similar to maybe a toilet training one that you may use. So the task is washing hands, but they can see it all together as a whole. And that then helps them see, I don't have to just do one step and then the next, I can see this picture as a whole. Lovely also to use vocabulary, to use lots of verbs, lots of action words, dripping, and spraying, rubbing, so many words that once we've got the pictures, we can pair those words with the pictures versus just using the oral language we use when talking to kids and often it goes in one ear and out the next, or it might just be on a sensory level too much for them to hear us talking all the time. You know, it sometimes sounds, feels like a drill through their ears 
with every extra sentence that we're saying. And finally, a daily visual schedule to just give them a real overview of their day. So I do apologize that I, I had to cover or sort of touch on so many different things, but I wanted to, as I said, just give you that, that real feel for what are all things speech language related in the area of Fragile X. And do feel that you've at least got some things that you can now go away with and say, yeah, I want to, I want to look more into that. Um, I want to find out more about that. The one area that I didn't go into as much detail as I wanted to was the idea of the oral motor exercises and skills. So the reason why it's controversial is because there's no real evidence to show that doing all these oral motor exercises actually helps with or supports clear speech or language development. However, and here's the big however, we know in Fragile X that if we have low tone, which means low muscle tone, by strengthening that muscle tone, it's giving us a better foundation on which to work in order to then work on the speech, okay? Another thing is the oromotor exercises, things like the biting, et cetera, all the blowing are often very calming. And that's why we encourage them in this population as well. I certainly don't believe, even though there isn't the evidence that it improves speech, I don't believe it can do any harm either. Um, and that's why, yeah, although a lot of speeches may say we don't do oral motor type work, it can help reduce the sensitivity around the facial area. Many individuals with fragile X tend to overstuff their mouth because of that low oral sensitivity, or they just may not get the same feedback that others would get. So they stuff the full mouth because otherwise it doesn't feel like there's anything inside the mouth for them. All of these areas by working in the oral area and doing that exploratory play, like I said, can certainly help. So in this population, would I advocate for doing some oral motor type work? Yes, but the best way to improve speech is through speech, okay? End of the day, we still need to work on speech directly through speech practice. Okay, so let's go back to the final summary now, and then I'm very happy to open the floor for some questions. So I'll just share that last slide and then see if we've in fact covered some of the things I claimed I would. We started off by understanding the difference between speech and language, and that you don't need speech in order to still have some language skills. The phenotypic behaviors, understanding anxiety, hyperarousal, and the learning style of individuals with fragile X. Motor speech difficulties, such as dyspraxia, the sequencing and coordination. We know that sequencing's hard, we know coordination's hard. It makes sense why so many individuals in this population have dyspraxia. I did touch on the oral motor activities and why are we doing them in fragile X? Parent responsiveness for language stimulation, the idea of being there, being at the child's level, being involved in the play um, and using the hand and type strategies because interaction, actually sharing the moment with your child comes before language. So we really need to build up on those interaction skills and that joint tension before we start working directly on language. Strategies, we spoke about sharing books versus just reading books. And finally, how visuals and AAC not only aids comprehension, but can actually give them a voice with which to express themselves as well. One last thing I will say with the AAC is that it's important for everybody to speak the AAC method, not just for the child to be expected to use it. So when I am teaching a concept, for example, every time I say finished, I'll use the sign finished to go with it. So it's not something that we expect the individual with fragile X to use in a language that they only speak. The idea is that everyone in the environment needs to speak AAC as well. That way, the understanding is increasing, as well as when there's opportunities for them to use it, their expressive language is increasing as well. Right, good stuff. 
Right, I am happy for us to go to questions. Let's do it. Well, thank you, Bev. We we have, a, it's actually more of a comment than mm -hmm. a question. Parents, they like to share that if individuals are nonverbal, to not perhaps get too hung up on it. She refers to her own experience with her adult son. Feels that if she was to continuously focus on encouraging him to verbalise, it may increase his anxiety and her own anxiety. Um, and perhaps that it's good sometimes to just let things go. And I think it comes back to that idea of interacting and the importance of the interaction versus focusing on the speech and on the language and being in the moment with that individual and appreciating them for who they are and working from their strengths rather than always putting the emphasis on the deficits. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from, from anybody? There's a question that we have, biting and spitting, is this hyperarousal? And the parent asks, should we look at other math activities as a strategy? So I'm going to answer on behalf of Babe Kadish, and then she can, if she disagrees with me, she can absolutely jump in. Chances are, you know, we look at the ABC, the A is the antecedent, the B is the actual behaviour itself, the biting and the spitting, and the C is the consequence. So it's, you know, what is actually causing that behavior? And do we see, excuse me, biting and spitting as a result of hyperarousal? Absolutely we do. But again, we might be looking at well, what is the child actually avoiding? Or what is the child uh, trying to communicate to us through the biting and through the spitting? So if it is a sensory based behavior or a means for them to try and regulate their own arousal level, what we could do in that case is certainly provide a more appropriate alternative, such as an item in their Bob box. Yeah, because we still need to feed the need rather than don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, but just feed it in a more appropriate way than doing something like the biting or spitting. Bev, do you want to add on? I think while we sometimes use the Bob box, I find that generally biting and spitting is hyperarousal or anxiety driven. And as Bev said, it's, a, it's an attempt to avoid doing something, something that is too challenging, taking them well out of their comfort zone and causing that hyperarousal. And that's what that behavior is communicating to us. Thank you. Thank you, Bev and Bev. <laughs> Another question is from a parent. Can you ask Bev if she knows of any Compic apps? That, that's the pictures that this parent uses um, for her adult sons. So I myself don't, Sarah. I don't know if there's any that you know that particularly use Compic. So Compic is a particular symbol system. There's also Board Maker, which is an alternate one. Widget would be a, a similar, but different one as well. I'm not familiar with any um, that are app-based that particularly use the actual Compic pictures, but I'd be very surprised if you went onto the Compic website, if they didn't have sort of a contact us, and I'd imagine that they would have more knowledge of if there are any that have been designed using actual Compic versus another symbol system. Sarah, do you know of any that particularly use Compic? No, I don't know any. Another way of it. So I also know Compic was used a lot sort of 15, 20, 15, 15 years ago. It certainly was the main one that was used, whereas now I think there's a whole range of others that are being used as well. So the fact that, you know, the apps are more sort of current, I'm wondering if that's maybe why some of them don't use Compic and use other symbolic systems. Yeah. I use broad makers and lesson picks mainly. Mm, lesson picks is another one. So it's lesson P I X picks, spelled like that. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Another question with minimal verbal expressive language is the receptive language level usually much higher in Fragile X? Hmm. So in any individual, we do tend to expect the receptive language to be stronger and in my experience yes that certainly does follow suit with individuals with fragile x as well but it's usually the concrete vocabulary 
that is strong, not necessarily on the receptive side, not necessarily the, um, the abstract concepts. Again, the abstract reasoning is a real area of difficulty. And again, anything that requires the working memory to, to hold it intact, the receptive language, no matter how strong a jail system is out of whack at the time, we know the receptive language will really struggle. So just because an individual usually has strong or relatively strong receptive language, doesn't mean in the moment they'll always be able to use that strength because of their sensory system and the enormous impact that the sensory system has on their on their functioning. Sarah, do you want to answer about the receptive versus the expressive? I agree with you. So yeah, that's right. the profile. So generally receptive language is a strength, but the, because of the working memory and the sensory profile, sometimes it's hard for them to use receptive, receptive language to actually uh, understand and comprehend what is going on. Thank you. I'm just, I've noticed um, my 20 year old son, he had very limited language, predominantly just repeats words, echolalia. I have noticed that in a higher sensory environment, he struggled, struggled a lot more with language skills. He since ended up being in the hospital for a couple of months and was put into a one-to-one -in -one, one -one accommodation setting. And we have noticed since he's been put in there that we are seeing a lot more communication coming from him, he, even to the point where he previously could not even handle the anxiety of being on the phone or on a video call, where now he's now video calling me every day. And we're sort of now slowly focusing on slowing that language down and progressing like he used to just say, I love you. After I'd say it now, he says, I love you so much. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> and we, um, it's very important that their environment does have that really stable, minimal sensory input so that they can learn and progress better. Because Thank you so much for sharing that story. And uh, I love that story so much. Um, yeah, it really is that leg of the stool, the anxiety leg of the stool. I did make reference before. Bev and I started working with a young man who, when due to a range of you know things in his sort of case history, he just he he was so overwhelmed with anxiety that yeah. the only person he'd speak to was his sister. And even then he would, you know, with his mum, for example, he would only write. He would not use any verbal communication whatsoever. And we both worked really slowly with him. We started off through emails because he was able to send emails. We went, you know, we started with the emails and from emails, we very slowly progressed to having a phone call with a family member and him speaking to the sister and the sister then talking to us. And the idea of him coming on a Zoom call was just never, ever even thought to be a possibility. Mm -hmm. And now, in less than a year, I've got him as part of a young men's social skill group on Zoom with these individuals he's never even met before. And he talks to us, he has his sessions on Zoom now. It's just, it's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle that when that anxiety is decreased, whether it be because of the sensory background or the lack of you know, predictability or whatever the case is, that the language will flourish. And that's what, you know, what I'm hearing from you, that just in this calmer setting, that yeah. has been the biggest thing that has enabled the language. There's also some fantastic studies that have been done on individuals with fragile X with anti-anxiety medication, where the language score significantly improved once yep. that absolute extreme anxiety, once that edge, you know, had, had been taken off. So, yeah, the yeah, we found with medication that it was very limited in, in its ability to work, also based on his environment. And we've now seen with the change of environment that the... And, the medication, I dare say, as well in combination, has had a, has a really good effect on him, and we're seeing a lot more progress. Previously, most of his 
form of communication was through aggression behaviors uh, vocalizing in in non not in ways that we couldn't really understand what he was meaning mm. so we, we relied a lot on him um gesturing when he could calm down or showing us things on the computer so yeah we would we would really want to keep progressing from there but um and so uh, yeah we just need to identify as well what what it is that it's work is working for him and and keep going from there. Sounds like he's doing great and so are you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This is the last of the two-part series of webinars on communicating and connecting, but we are thrilled that you are going to be joining us again early next year, Bev, to present a webinar on social stories. And whilst you've touched on that today, we look forward to you um, talking more about social stories. And thank you so much to everybody who's joined us this evening. And a reminder to everybody to forward any suggestions that you'd like to, that you have regarding any future webinars. We're always keen at the Fragile X Association to create materials which increase people's awareness and educate the Fragile X community and those supporting Fragile X families. Have a very peaceful and safe evening. Thank you. Thank you.